Hello, everyone. Welcome to Type Talks. And today we have our three lovely guests, Susan Storm, Emily, aka Pukoki, and Megan Malone. And I'm going to let my guests introduce themselves to you. <laughs> uh, Susan? My name is Susan Storm, and I'm the founder of psychologyjunkie.com. And I've been an MBTI practitioner for I don't know how many years, but I've been studying it for over 10 years now. And just love, I'm excited to have this discussion with you guys. And Megan Malone? Would you like to do the honors? <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Megan Malone. I'm the founder of infjblog.com. Um, I also have a lot of social media pages where I just talk about INFJ stuff. Um, I'm also working on setting up a consulting service. So I will be able to do type consultings for individuals and couples um, and organizations. And um, I also have a book on Amazon called The Complete Guide to Understanding the INFJ Personality Type. And on my website, you can buy it in either book. Awesome. <laughs> and Emily? Hey guys, I'm Emily, or Pakoki is my channel. Um, it's pretty hard to follow <laughs> these two <laughs> as far as like what they've accomplished and what they've done. Um, all I can say is, I mean, I've had a YouTube channel for like two, oh, two years, over two years. Um, and I've been studying Myers Briggs for over 10 years and Socionics for eight years. Um, so I do know a lot about this stuff, but I don't, I don't claim to be an expert and I'm definitely not um, a, pr a practitioner and stuff like that. But yeah, I just find it very interesting and stuff like that. So experience is really good too. It, there's a certain wisdom that comes from seeing it in practice too, that you don't get through certification, but you get through lived experience. That That is a good title yeah. too. I'm Joyce and I'm an MBTI practitioner and we're going to talk about INFJs and we're going to ask each other questions and you're going to get to know a little bit about the mind of the INFJ and we're going to have a deep dive together. My first question for you guys is what do you think INFJs bring to the world or specifically what do you believe that you bring to the world? <laughs> Who wants to go first? <laughs> <laughs> I could start, I guess. Um, Definitely. I think that INFJs have a great way of seeing the potential in things, seeing how things could be, and then really putting all their energy behind making it happen. Um, one book that I really love, it's called Building Blocks of Personality Type, talks about how NI is really good at strategic thinking. And um, so I really, I love seeing that in INFJs and INTJs, um, but also seeing like what would be helpful for people, um, you know, if they're in the wrong course in life or the right course in life, not necessarily being like, you're doing the wrong thing or being like preachy about it, but just helping people with seeing like the future implications of what they're doing or what, you know, whether an idea is good, kind of really inspiring them to go after it. That's awesome. Um, I agree with Susan. So I think INFJs are really good at, like she said, seeing potential, specifically potential in people and helping guide people towards um, maybe better outcomes or helping them find better outcomes for themselves than they might be able to find on their own. I think that's why a lot of INFJs go into counseling and coaching um, because they're so skilled at this naturally. Um, and yeah, I think in, in helping kind of inspire through that, maybe not inspirational the same way that you would see other NF types like an ENFP or something, um, but, but being kind of someone that can understand your, your perspective and where you're coming from and, and help you see where you want to be and then um, kind of inspiring you to get there. Yep. And well, you, Emily? Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, both of them said it very well. Uh, I mean, I was just going to say we are very individualistic uh, in the sense of, like, when we do, like they said, when we're trying to inspire someone, it's not necessarily like an ENFP or an INFP or an ENFJ, especially ENFJs, I feel like, because they're very good at, like, group dynamics and, like, think of, like, the Oprahs of the world who are very good at, like, putting on a show for a mass audience. Um, I think where INFJs shine is touching lot people's lives on a very one-on-one um, -on -one basis and inspiring them to action. And then in their own life, like Susan said, having um, introverted intuition and being that strategic mind, um, which 
also inspires other people as well. When they get close to an INFJ, they realize how how much they actually maybe know and strategize about things, and that can be uh, that can definitely make people um, not only feel better about themselves, but feel better about like their future and what they need to do in the future. That's beautiful, guys. I guess what I think INFJs bring to the world, or specifically what I see myself bringing to the world, is my philosophical view on relationships. So I kind of noticed where relationships could be strengthened in the sense that like where people could treat each other more kindly or to be treating each other with more humaneness. And I feel like my strength lies in my ability to figure out what makes relationships more kind, what makes relationships better and how can people foster more long-term fulfilling uh, bonds with other people yeah so it's like this big picture view on relationships yeah yeah <laughs> sorry, I, was, I was just wanted to add to that I'm sorry yeah, um, for sure. uh I, I was thinking about that just today about my business and people that I work with. And I was like, how can I make the relationships better for these people that I work with? And I was like, I need to have a meeting probably next week to uh, just like figure out some stuff with that. And um, so when you said that, it's, I was like, wow, I was like just thinking about that. And I think that's such a great point and something that, that we offer because not everyone thinks like that and, and goes to that and acknowledges the importance of relationships, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, INFJs are good at taking a 10,000 foot view, like a bird's eye view of their relationships and having like a level headed way of seeing how it could be better or like helping the dynamic because they can see it from a detached way. And that allows them to have perspective on the issue and not view it from like too close. INFJs are really good at meta, meta analyzing their bonds. <laughs> so, so Susan, uh, you had a question too, and I thought that'd be cool to bring up. Oh, um, yeah, one of the things that I have noticed with me and uh, several other INFJs that I've, I've known over the years is that we sometimes find it really easy to um, blend in with people and connect easily in social settings and get to know people relatively easily, but then actually forming really deep, loyal friendships and you know where you can really be yourself um, seems to be a real struggle for a lot of INFJs. And I guess I was wondering, you know, this is something for sure I've experienced where I can be really polite and I really actually very much like people, so, you know, regardless of what all those introvert memes say about, you know, leave me alone in my house. But, um, um, but it is very difficult for me to find people who enjoy the same topics of conversation, um, the same, just who I feel like you, we can get to know on like a really uh, deep, uh, transparent level. Do you guys also feel like that's something that you struggle with? Yes, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, almost like it's hard to talk about the things that I enjoy in day to day life because people don't really care about it as much. I end up, you know, talking about the things the other person wants to talk about yeah. or like the things that are going on with them because I know that the moment it goes to the conversations I like, I could like lose them or like, I, it's kind of like an alien conversation to bring up. And I know that you kind of have this deeper side that you don't really feel permission to show everywhere. But I feel like that's maybe a people thing too. And it's like society at large doesn't allow us to show who we really are. Um, and that it's, it's like, we kind of have to hide the part of us that we need to show in order to feel seen or to feel valued. And I feel like it's a large scale human thing, but I feel like INFJs deal with it a little more because of that introverted intuition. It's just like, it's hard to show that. It's kind of like hard to communicate in a way that doesn't lose people because it's so abstract. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that this is why INFJs are like, like moths to a flame when it comes to personality type, because it's something that we're, we're naturally interested in, like human behavior and understanding people. And it's also like a group, you know, for us, you know, we know each other through, you know, social media and blogging and stuff. And there's other people out there that are interested in it too, and want to talk about the same things. And so um, I think that's why you see so many INFJs 
that are into this personality type stuff. It's just because like, this is something that we're interested in. And maybe we don't have or we don't feel like we have that outlet to talk about this kind of stuff with everyone else in our life. There's just not that interest there. Um, I know that for me, like I've been people that have don't know me well, um, I think I definitely show my extroverted feeling more. Um, and I've had people say I'm, I'm probably an ISFJ, uh, people that don't know me because of that. And I think that the reason, like you said, Joyce, it's because people don't see um, our dominant function, you know, we're outputting our first extroverted function. So we're outputting that feeling and we're trying to just make people, you know, feel good in the moment a lot of times. Um, and we do that by, you know, adapting a lot. And that's why I think INFJs are often called like chameleon personality types, because there's a lot of adapting to our environment, um, just in order to connect to get that kind of connection that the feeling function is wanting. Yeah, that's a good explanation for why that happens. Yeah, cool. And Megan, you, you had a question that you wanted to ask too. <laughs> yeah, how do I phrase this? So um, I guess my question is, do you guys ever feel like you need to kind of reevaluate your personality type or reassess your type? And when you do, um, how do you, you internally determine what um, makes sense for you? I, I guess when you're you're going through that, and really it was more of a thought that I had that I, I expressed to Joyce earlier that was, um, you know, when I'm reevaluating my type, what makes sense to me are the perceiving functions. Um, and this is not make, what makes sense when I'm reading about it, but makes sense when I'm like internalizing it. Um, my perceiving functions seem more real to me because I think that's like my primary mode of like how I see the world, right? And it's also my dominant function is introverted intuition. And so that makes, that feels more real if that makes sense to me. Whereas the judging functions, the feeling and thinking feel more almost put on me by the outside world. And I have to kind of think what is me versus what is how people see me. Um, and so I think I just naturally struggle I don't struggle to identify, but but when I'm just thinking about my type and maybe other INFJs out there, or people that are just trying to figure out their type, um, it could be helpful for them to, if they relate to this. Um, I feel like I'm really kind of rambling because this is just kind of a half thought out thought, but um, any any thoughts on that? <laughs> I relate yeah. to that a lot. Yeah, I, I've definitely doubted my type probably since the very beginning and, um, yeah, I, I spoke with the, actually the instructor of my the MBTI course that I took about it because I was like, I don't know, like, because every partially because there's such a um, hype about INFJs and like they're so rare and all this stuff and everyone's mistyped as them. So you're kind of like, oh, what if I'm one of those people that's mistyped? And I definitely relate to MISE. Like that's, I don't doubt that, but I do sometimes wonder about FE. TI because I think it's not as personal to us as like NI is it's right. um, you know FE does sometimes feel like a chore to put on you know it's like it's it's what you do like around people but it's not something that you, you it gets, does get tiring over time it's not something that um yeah I mean that's what helps me is like getting around FI users like when I'm around FI dominant types I'm like okay I, I know I'm not FI dominant now because I can see the difference like really clearly in person but if I haven't been interacting with a lot of people I'm not seeing it play out in real life then I can I start to get more and more confused um like oh maybe I'm using FI right now or maybe I'm using SI right now but what I do is like I remind myself that like we all use it all eight functions yeah. like you couldn't get through the day <laughs> without without any one of those eight functions, it would be, you know, a total wreck. So um, <laughs> there will be times when you use SI or TE or, you know, whatever it is. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm still, I always tell people I'm like open if, if you have a different opinion about what type you think I am, like, I'd love to hear your argument because I love hearing new information. So um, I don't know if that helps you answer your question, but I definitely relate to, not being 100% sure. How I rationalize what Megan said is um, FE, 
so I'm creating a model. It's going to be called dynamic archetypes. And like the second function is called the background in my model. And basically FE takes on a high resolution. So it's very clear, but it is a passive role, like a background. So it's like, you may not identify with it. Like you may value it, but you don't fixate on it. So it doesn't feel as real as your dominant which is your lens, like NI is like your lens and which everything passes through. It's kind of like that water. So that water is more real than a background. Um, so I kind of see it as FE is that, you know, comes on when people are around because it's an extroverted function and it like is taking in externally when it's happening. It's a momentary type of sensation, but the NI is with you no matter if people are there or not. And so it feels more real in that sense. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, so Emily, do you have any thoughts that you'd like to add? Yeah, I definitely do. Um, so I always, I mean, especially when I really felt confident in saying what my type was, um, especially on the internet. Um, so when I first took the test when I was about like 16, so almost, well, I guess it was almost 10 years, I mean, over 10 years ago now, because um, I'm 26. But um, I took, I actually typed as an ENFJ. And um, it didn't, that doesn't surprise me really, because in high school, I was very introverted. So actually, to everybody else, that would seem like uh, you're clearly not an extrovert, um, especially anybody that knew me like high school and before, I was one of the most introverted, like quiet people. Mm -hmm at my school. Um, but I felt like I related a lot to extroverted feeling and obviously introverted intuition as well. Um, because I do genuinely, general, genuine, genuinely, genuinely love people. Like I love to be around people, but like you guys were saying with FE, it can be like, I can only take certain doses of it like at a time. I can't be, um, I can't have a constant like, I don't know, have to put on like a show for people, which I don't necessarily always feel like that, but especially when I'm working, um, especially in, in service type jobs, you feel like you have to put on a show for people. And the way I have really gone down to um, feeling more secure about my personality type, which it was very clear that it was an INFJ over an ENFJ. Um, and they are sister types. But what I see is I look at like a grid in my head and I have all of the personality types and I go over all the cognitive functions and everything like that. And I narrow down personality types. That's kind of my thing that I do a lot, even typing people. And I don't feel 100% confident typing people all the time, but um, just narrowing down, do I do I relate to this function and stuff like that. Um, for me, um, I definitely feel the sense of being on the NI SE axis for sure. But more than anything, I think there is a definite FE FI divide um, that I fall into the FE um, category. I don't know. It's just kind of a weird thing that I have like in my mind, but. Um, I think it's always good to question your type and not everybody is typed correctly. I think if you just take the test, especially if you don't take it by a professional, um, there is a high likelihood that you will be mistyped. I wasn't, t I didn't take the test from a professional standpoint. I took it online, like on probably human metrics or something like that. And there are definitely personality tests out there that I feel like are a little bit less accurate than others if that makes sense. And I think it's definitely something you need to consider. Um, yeah, so I don't know if that answered the question, but. Yeah, yeah I yeah. completely relate with that. And I guess I'll share a little bit about my typing journey too. So I took um, the human metrics test when I was 14, uh, cause my friend made me take it. And they're like, oh, I already know your type. And then I, I took it and I got the type that they thought 
I would be, which is INFJ. But um, I read through all 16 profiles because I wanted to make sure if I related to any of them more than the INFJ profile. So what I did was I was like, well, I'm open to being any other type. So I read through them and I, I read the ISFJ one and it, it said they're nurturer. I'm like, well, I can see myself as being pretty nurturing. I'm like, so I, I'm divided between this profile and that profile. They, they sound equally like me. And my, my friend who's an ENFP provided a really good argument for why I was intuitive. And this was before I learned about the cognitive functions. Uh, when I learned about the functions, I knew I had to be N-I-S-E. But um, when I was learning about the letter dichotomies, she was telling me about how when I talk, it's vague. And it's about this grand stance on like a philosophy on life or human psychology in some way. And I saw a lot of merit in that because I felt different from um people when I was younger I just didn't know why and I felt like when my ENFP explained that to me I had a reasoning for why my brain was a little quirkier like a little wired differently than other people and it was it struck me as real and the thing is I guess one of the reasons I really love typology is because I see something similar between the types like they occupy a similar uh wiring space it may not be the same because we're all our unique individuals but I, I saw one of emily's videos before and she talked about how friends are in your life for a season a reason or a lifetime and i was like i love that thought and i'm like i spent like the rest of the day or like i sometimes think about it to try to like continue it and to flesh it out completely because i thought there was something really beautiful about that idea i'm like what does it really mean to have like a friend for a reason or a friend for a season or a lifetime i'm like it's so cute too like to think about that it's like all your friends serve a purpose this and they're all there and provide value in some way and I was like that's so beautiful <laughs> so that brings me to my next question what makes you feel the most you so what energizes you who wants to start off <laughs> I'll start <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> none of us are like me um uh so what makes me feel the most energized um I guess my answer would be um, like learning, I, I guess is a good way to put it. Um, I mean, I'm a, I've always been a writer. And so writing is a way that I learn um, because I flesh out a lot of like those abstract ideas that I don't really always like maybe totally make sense of in my head when I write. Um, and so writing, whether it's journaling or it's writing, you know, my blog or something, um, but also just, just kind of learning and, and, and observing, I guess. Um, it's not like a great way to put it, but, um, you know, like I want to understand things. Like that's been my whole like focus since I was young is like, how can I truly like understand this from like all perspectives, you know, like there's something that's going on in the world or um, there is a relationship issue or, um, you know, no matter what it is, it's like, I want to like really understand this. And I think the kind of conversations, um, about that kind of stuff are really energizing to me. I like to talk about like spiritual things, religion, um, stuff like that. Not necessarily like any in particular, just kind of like how, you know, I think that all religions are, are connected. I think they're all like one, like different paths to the same end, you know? And so like, the stuff like that, um, just kind of how the world works. I don't know. <laughs> just the conversations about people and humanities and um, that kind of stuff for sure. And um, also, you know, like I'm a feeler. I like environments where people are happy and taken care of. Like that's always going to make me happy too. So um, I agree with like what Emily was saying that sometimes, and Susan, sometimes it can feel like work uh, creating those environments because that's not like our dominant process. Um, but I enjoy creating them because of the, the, the experience that you get from that. And so, um, yeah, yes, that's my answer. That's lovely. For me, did you have something you were gonna say though? Cause I, mm. okay. <laughs> um, for me, I think I feel the most, but the question was, when do you feel the most you? Was that it? Mm -hmm. um, I think I feel the most me when, similar to Megan, um, I like learning and I like grasping kind of 
uh, to these abstract concepts. Like I loved reading Carl Jung's book, A Man and His Symbols, because it talked a lot about symbolism and dreams and what he had learned through trying to understand what different people's dreams meant. So that to me was like super exciting. Um, and um, I remember when I found Dario Nardi's Google talk that he did about neuroscience and personality and I was like so excited like my heart was beating really fast and <laughs> I was like Daniel for Christmas I get to like to my husband uh, I get to like find out more information and so that was really fun um I also I think I feel the most me though like the at my best when I am when a, a vision comes to me of like something that will work hmm like in the future and I, and the strategy is all right there, but I have to perfect it. Like a lot of times it shows up in business because I really like um, business related things. You know, I grew up with an entrepreneur for a dad and it was just like, I love that, that I love that it's to me, it's kind of like playing a game. Like some people like playing video games and some people like playing board games. I actually like playing board games, but to me, business is a game. It's like, you envision where you want to be, like what you want to create or what you want to do in maybe five or 10 years. And then it's just a matter of putting all the pieces in the right order um, and getting your moves right. And I, that to me is incredibly fun. And I feel like I'm at playing to my strengths quite a bit when I'm doing that. And when someone comes to me and asks, like I can work with other people to help them with their dreams, you know, like something that they're trying to do um, and I can find ways to integrate what they're good at into some kind of plan or strategy. Like I have a friend who does, you know, help startups and I used to do content, um, marketing for startups. And that was really fun because if you, you get these people with these exciting new ideas that were brand new, really novel and figuring out ways to make it really make it work. Um, so that to me, like, is really, really fun. I love playing games like Risk or- um, Me too. Yeah. <laughs> like, I love strategy games. The the more complicated, yes. the better. Like, um, Risk, uh, even Settlers of Catan, that one's, I love Settlers of Catan. Um, you know, just, there's a lot of ones I could name, but they're not, a lot of people don't know what they are. <laughs> but I love playing strategy games because I just love the process of being like, what am I, you know, I, I find them very like mentally stimulating and I feel like I'm really in the zone when I'm playing them. And like also counseling people, I, I'm sorry if I'm going on too long, but like counseling people, like people like confide in me, I feel really like happy that they trust me. It means a lot to me when people confide in me, like it makes me feel really honored. And that's when I think the FE comes out, if I can help somebody in some way and be a listening support system for them without judging them, like really listen to where they're at and try to understand. I love trying to get into people's heads and like figure out this yeah. is what it's like to be this person. Like I love psychological movies and things like that where you like really get into someone's perspective. Um, and other people tend to find them very like slow sometimes, but I'm like, this is so interesting because I really feel like when I watch movies, I'm there. I am in that person's shoes. Like I feel like I'm like very much empathic about movies, <laughs> which I think a lot of people are, but a lot of people also aren't. Like my husband just thinks I'm a weirdo because I'm like, but it can feel the pain they're feeling. But um, so yeah, understanding people. And then like Megan said, like talking about spiritual subjects, like getting to understand different religions or different, um, the ways different people think and what the meaning of you know overall meaning of life is really that's it's all fun for me so now i'm done rambling now and it's one of joyce or emily can <laughs> so I, for me what makes me feel the most me is when i talk to people who can speak my language i, I kind of see it like there's a tweet that says be around people who can speak your language so you don't have to spend the rest of your lifetime translating your soul. And in a sense, it's kind of like being around people who where you can talk and they won't shut it down. Or I think this is a human thing though. So it's like, I just like to say things and feel seen or feel like understood or feel like at home with people. And what makes me feel at home is the when people understand 
like my philosophical sayings because um I normally say them for like a like there's a pinpointed thing beneath it and sometimes like people take my words at surface value but it's not supposed to be that it's supposed to be like this analysis of the human condition or something and then it's not reciprocated it's like I'm sending a bait and someone isn't reciprocating the bait and I'm like well then my conversation bait wasn't taken and now I feel like it feels kind of lonely in the conversation mm -hmm. it's like when you talk about something that sparks your NI and then it's not met with reciprocation it feels like a psychological loneliness because your cognitive wiring is being dismissed in some way and I, I bet like a lot of intuitives might deal with this or it's just a human thing in general but um it's something that I go through a lot because I talk about very esoteric subjects i like talking about psychology and ph philosophy and the human mind and what like what makes you happy like what about your human experience is important to you all these topics that dig a little deeper than what people normally talk about and it kind of like makes me happy to know these things about people because i i feel close to people when i can talk about abstract concepts with them i feel like there's always a barrier between me or that person if i'm not allowed to to speak esoterically or like to me it's not esoteric to me it's the clearest thing ever but to to other people it, it can be lost in translation and I can feel like my existence is kind of lost in translation mm -hmm. that so it's nice to have like you guys you know Megan Susan Emily where I can talk to uh, about these things and feel like you guys get my frequency and you guys get my wavelength <laughs> yeah for sure I agree with that I've definitely yeah. felt that putting out the bait, like, can we talk about, can we go here? And then having it rejected and it feels like, okay, let's talk about paint color some more. <laughs> you know, <laughs> something that's like really. You know, even sometimes when people, people try to meet you there, but you're just on like, it just feels like you're on different wavelengths. And then it's just like, we're not talking about the same thing. It's not mm -hmm. even worth me continuing because we're not matching up. And that can be frustrating too. For both people, I guess, but I've definitely experienced that before. I think that's so really. True. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I have you really. Yeah, Pukoki. <laughs> um, yeah, Megan, I agree with that. I think in going back to FE, like, I think that's where it can be draining for us is like, because we're really good at matching people, just like the chameleon thing. We're good mm -hmm. at matching. Like, we will meet you on that wavelength. Um, mm -hmm even though it's not the wavelength we are on or that we want to be on necessarily. Um, for me, I related to all three of you guys um, as far as like what um, excites me and stuff, but um, more than even typology, which I am very interested in typology and understanding like the human mind and stuff. Um, I would say like an overarching umbrella that I'm like very energized about is um, human potential and also personal development. I've been studying personal development a lot, well, not a lot longer, but um, at least a few years before I even got into like personality theory. I was like 12 when I first got into personal development. Um, and I just found that very, I found solace in that because I felt very misunderstood by so many other people. And I was able to kind of, I don't know, use that as a way of like, feeling like I can, uh, I don't know, find my lane in life because I think, especially as INFJs, we get told all the time as when we're going through school and we're younger that there's something maybe wrong with us if we actually like show who we are to people rather than just putting on this FE mask. Um, so yeah, and also I really love inspiring people and getting people to realize their own potential as well. So, I ever want to ride like the fast track to becoming my friend? Talk about what Puko, uh, what Emily said about human potential and personal development. You, it doesn't have like I. I'd like to hear your view on it. Like not some scripted view that you've read in a book, but like what is a view you've formed through living, or like just your general thoughts on it. Like. I, Another thing that makes me feel kind of lonely is when someone says an opinion, but it's not their opinion. It's something that they've like read online. And you can you can tell that it's not something that they've thought of themselves because it's lacking some sort of depth to it. And I'm like, just tell me what you think. I'm like, just 
like create this philosophy of what you think about personal development or like your life or stuff. And I feel alone in the sense that when I met with philosophical topics, sometimes people are reciting information they've read instead of telling me their earnest thoughts about it. And it's so lonely that way. Cause it's like, I'm talking to a book and I'm, <laughs> does that make sense? Um, yeah. But yeah, enough mm -hmm. about me. Yeah. And, and another thing that, and, just communication and relationships that I really value is when people can't, or maybe they don't understand where you're going with something, but they react with like, Hey, I don't, I don't understand that. Can you explain it to me more? Or like, they're like enthusiastic about understanding. Like that's the best kind of reciprocation. I think as an INFJ, I can get from someone who doesn't quite understand maybe where I'm at with something. Um, but just expresses that like they still care and they want to understand, you know, and, and wants to hear that from me. Cause otherwise I'm just going to shut down. If I don't get that, I'm just going to say, well, okay, you're not interested in this conversation. So I'm just going to shut it down. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I have a question. Um, yeah. That's been burning. I mean, um, I've asked so many people this question that it's kind of like repetitive, but um, do you guys have an internal monologue? So do you hear a verbal voice in your head? And I, because, okay, before I say this, um, I don't necessarily think it's correlated with personality type, but I'm not sure exactly what it's correlated with. Um, but go ahead. Um, so I do, my answer is yes. I remember reading about that actually, about it being somewhat correlated um, with like parts of the brain or something, brain activity, but I can't remember the specifics of that. Um, but I've, I've seen a little bit on it. And yes, I, I think for the most part, I do have an internal monologue. I'm thinking about things um, as I would like speak about them, probably more clearly, like in my mind, it makes sense. And, and maybe not, I don't know, <laughs> it's, hard to, it's hard to explain, but I think generally the answer is yes. <laughs> Okay. What about you guys? Um, I feel like it comes on and off. Like mm -hmm. a lot of times when I'm thinking, I'm thinking in pictures more than words. Like I'll, I'll think, okay, I'm, I'm experiencing something, but it doesn't come to me like in my brain. I'm not saying I'm experiencing something. It's like, what does this feel like? And it's like a picture comes to my brain. Mm -hmm. Like um, that's kind of, do you hear a voice in your head at any point though? No. Okay, mm -hmm. so you don't have an internal monologue. Yeah, no, sorry, I was thinking of through like, if you're thinking and your thinking's in words or not, rather than like- Yeah, it has to be in words um, for it to be an internal monologue. Yeah, I don't, I don't hear a voice like- Yeah. What about you, Joyce? For me, I don't hear an internal monologue, but I do see like um, visuals. So like when I'm experiencing something, I might, have a visual um, pattern connected to it. So it's kind of like when I think about rebirthing, I think about sometimes I, to motivate myself, I think about wings and like sprouting wings. It helps me to motivate myself, <laughs> but um, yeah. Yeah, see, personally, I definitely have an internal monologue. I mean, I can hear my, like I can hear a voice, like even as I talk to you guys, I can still talk to myself like in a verbal, clear voice. Um, and I also can think in like pictures and abstract things as well. But to me, I my mind was completely blown that some people do not hear a voice in their head at all. And that's what an internal monologue is. And it's just, it's really fascinating. I'm actually making a video on it. But it was interesting because um, I've heard mixed reviews from people that are INFJs. And I've definitely seen a cor correlation with certain personality types so I think certain personality types are more likely to have an internal monologue than others. And then INFJs, it's been kind of like some do, some don't, and some like sometimes do. So it's interesting. But That's interesting. I guess Megan and I are <laughs> in the same group of the people that do. Oh, that's so interesting. <laughs> I, mean, like, I feel like it's, you know, like if I'm thinking like planning and stuff, I'll be like kind of like thinking like this is what I'm going to do and the words like, you know, like I'm 
but I don't hear a voice like that. Yeah, you have to hear it in order. For yeah, no, I definitely don't hear so it. So I can have like conversations in my mind with myself, like, and it yeah. sounds like my voice. Hmm, yeah, no, don't have that at all. Yeah, isn't that mind boggling though? That like some <laughs> people do and some people don't. Like, you know, like in movies where there's like a narrator and they're just like sitting there and that's like supposed to be their thoughts. That's <laughs> legitimately like what people that have an internal monologue feel. Like, I mean, like think yeah. like it's just yeah, like that, it is interesting i um yeah i guess i assumed when people were talking about that they meant like they're thinking in words <laughs> like like you know they're processing in words i didn't realize it meant you actually like just you hear it. a verbal voice in your yeah. head huh that's yeah. interesting yeah a lot of people it's don't a, know what it means but yeah that's why i was trying to clarify it's so fascinating like how on the surface like we appear like very similar because we're humans but inside our experiences can be so different and that's why typology is so cool because it's like we all are human beings we share the same flesh suit but the wiring that's inside of us is actually different in a very surprising way like someone who takes the same test as you answers differently and i think there's a fascination to even that even if they didn't get their personality type correct it's like wow you could even take the same question and you could perceive it differently and like answer it differently and i think there's a fascination to that because like where does that come from <laughs> it's like wow we really are different <laughs> There was a question during the ENFJ group chat, which was, what is your idealized world? And I wanted to ask you guys that too. Um, as INFJs, what is your idealized world? <laughs> I think that my ideal world would be one where people try, at least try, even if it doesn't come natural to them, everybody at least puts the effort into understanding, like putting themselves in other people's shoes and under, Standing other people's experiences. Um, I think that would eliminate a lot of the conflicts that we have today. I, my ideal world wouldn't have like war, you know, the violent kind of war that we have now, because I, I see that as something completely unnecessary. And if I was leading things, there would be no way I would ever, I, I just don't see a path that would need to lead to that, that level if the world was prioritized that you know, prioritized empathy I guess um mm -hmm. more and and diplomacy and um you know rather than just winning you know I think we live in a a very like winning centric especially in the United States so I'm in Texas um but the United States is a very much like we have to achieve we have to win um kind of mentality that people have like they, they grew up in and um, I think that often triumphs caring for each other. Um, you know, success can triumph caring about your relationships with other people and how you treat people. And so um, I think my my ideal world would be like a lot different than what we have right now. It, it would be much more focused on understanding where other people are coming from and and focusing on making decisions that are in the best interest um, of as many people as possible. And yeah, probably a lot of other things, but that's kind of what comes to mind for me initially. That makes a lot of sense. I love that. And I guess my ideal world is, there's a book called Nonviolent Communication and it's by Marshall Rosenberg. And I believe that he's an INFJ. And I, my ideal world would be one where people don't have to violently communicate with each other. Because sometimes when we express a, a remark that hurts another person, it's due to an unmet need that they're experiencing. And if we were to get to the heart of why people fight and we were to get to like the bottom of why people ruin their relationships by accident like that would be an ideal world for me because i think that there's so much anguish and there's so much pain that is avoidable if we just listened a little more to each other we would be more intentional with our relationships and i guess an ideal world for me is where everyone is more intentional with their relationships because relationships are a sacred thing because they can be fragile. And sometimes someone you care about can be gone from your life in an instant. And because they are so fragile, they are important to take care of. And in my ideal world, it would be a world where we 
don't fight with people in a way that loses our respect for them? How can we keep our respect for people while still having opposing views? Like, I'm sure that's possible. So where is that win-win? My ideal world is where we don't have to spiral down when we argue and that we can find some sort of win-win uh, among people. <laughs> I mean, obvious, I mean, I agree with everything that you guys said. I think, I mean, when the, the first thought I had when you said ideal world is I'm thinking like Middle Earth and like the Shire. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, um, I think there's an, I think my ideal w world would be more, much more innocent than the world is right now. I um, have a very like fairy tale kind of, imagination of like wouldn't it be perfect if like people could hold on to their innocence longer and their sense of wonder and imagination um you know wouldn't it be great if we respected children and listened to what they had to say instead of talking down to them and just making them grow up really fast and pass all these tests and do all this uniform style of education where everyone has to fit in the same mold and do the same things and, and learn the same skills rather than teaching kids who are different, you know, who have different skills in different areas to really excel at what they are naturally drawn to um, as a mom. And, you know, I, I just feel like we force children so much to, to just like conform to this certain, you know, it's a uniform level of education, which I understand the technicalities and why that happens. But I, I mean, in my ideal world, you know, the kids who are the artists and the creatives and, you know, we would be like, that's amazing. We're going to, we're going to like inspire you and take those skills and really develop them. And the kids who, you know, want to be um, builders and, you know, everyone has like these unique skill sets and they would be able to develop those and, and, and enjoy learning because they're learning in a way that works for them and that they feel like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I can be, um, I can go after my um, dreams and also where, you know, adults learn from children, you know, children can be annoying and difficult and obnoxious and all those things, but there's a lot that we can learn from them because of their, their innocence and their wonder and their imagination and the fact that they haven't been, you know, um, the world does so much to people, like the older you get, the yeah, you, there's hurt and then you get biases and you develop all these like scales and armor that changes you the older you get. And so I think that it can be, we can learn a lot from people who haven't gotten that yet. Um, you know, people would read, people would just not feel like, okay, I'm a grown up. I have to be like this now. Like in my ideal world, we'd all be silly and we'd all be, you know, we, we'd have certain things that we wouldn't have had to just get rid of. Like people would, wouldn't have to develop all those, like all that armor on themselves because they'd, that would have been appreciated when they grew up. It wouldn't have been taken away from them so early. Um, and I think, you know, just respect and overall feeling, I guess, of respect for people, regardless of, you know, race, gender, <laughs> age you know just everyone being treated with respect i don't see things maybe the same way as you i don't care if i do i'm still going to treat you with respect i mean i know it sounds very like typical nf utopian kind of thing but i think another thing that really bothers me that's in the world now is where people take like one one like exaggerated facet of an argument and they put all the attention on that to invalidate an entire yeah. thing like, you do a lot in politics now where it's like yeah. So I don't know, Democrats do this one thing or Republicans do this one thing. Therefore, they're all like this, you know, and it's some like really weird thing that happened. Like, I don't know. I can't think of an example right now. So there's a lot of like really stupid arguing going on right now. It's like the people want to believe the worst of their opponent. And so they grab these like ridiculously extreme examples of something bad an opponent did. And then they said that their opponent, everyone in this like religion or, you know, gender orientation or uh, race or whatever it is, they're all this way. And I think that's something that in my ideal world that wouldn't happen so much. 
And I think that's why personal growth is so important because you get to a place where you realize like you're not making decisions to justify an opinion you already have. You're making decisions because it's in the best, uh, it's best for the overall outcome. And that might mean telling like getting an ego hit and learning that you're actually wrong or you were in the wrong and being able to acknowledge that. Um, that's something that I think is, is a big focus of people that are in personal development and which is all of you guys. And um, that's why I think there, there needs to be more of that in the world, teaching that kind of stuff. Yeah. Sorry, I just jumped no, in. To, I, no, I'm I, glad I you completely, did. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's wonderful. Um, I wanted to illustrate something that Susan said. Uh, she talked about retaining people's innocence. And I feel like this has to do with like, NI notices the domino effect that things lead to. So it's like, if we all just retained people's innocence a little better, we wouldn't have to deal with all of these neuroses they would have in the future. If only we protected this side of people a little more, they wouldn't have to go through so much suffering, unneeded suffering, or like a shift in psychology that is for the worse if we just helped to retain the beautiful things about them. So I feel like there's some NI in that too, but it's also very like NF to talk about this ideal state of people. <laughs> so Pukoki, uh, what are your thoughts? I mean, Emily, sorry. It's okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I relate to all of the stuff that you guys said. Um, I think a big takeaway, like, of course, I agree with like the whole silliness, which actually, uh, Susan, we'll talk about this later, but that does not sound very gamma quadra to me. Um, by the way, <laughs> by the way, that's like a beside the point. But um, anyways, um, I I think there's a lot of cancel culture out there. I think that's a good term for um, what we were describing as far as like seeing your point, opponent and like basically someone does one thing wrong. Um, oftentimes that's not the case. Like there are people that really do a lot of bad things, like people that, you know, kick, uh, commit like crimes that are especially against children. Um, obviously those people do need to be marked like as they need to be canceled. But in general, people are imperfect. And what you see like in society and what people show in public is very different than what you may see in private with a lot of people. And so it's very, I think the ideal world would have a lot of empathy um, it would be a lot more open um, and a lot less judgmental. Um, and also just really, I think we have a good, like as INFJs and NFs in general, we have a good um, sense of getting in, I would say mostly ENFJs and INFJs are really good at getting in other people's shoes and taking that journey. Like, I know you guys were talking about this earlier, but like I watch a commercial and I will be moved and I'll start crying. Like, I mean, I'm, it's, it's just something like, I definitely am not perfect about that, about like, I've definitely, um, you know, canceled people in my mind or something or, um, but I think it's just the lack of empathy, the lack of, um, I don't know, just realizing that we all have our strengths and just lifting up each other for those strengths and then helping each other with maybe the spots that were weakest. Like in the ideal world, I would still have people that are maybe more hands-on with things because I know that I'm not necessarily good at like, I don't know, doing everyday tasks, for example. <laughs> but um, I don't know if that makes sense. I, I definitely yeah. relate to a lot of the stuff that you guys said for sure, so. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought it was so beautiful when you guys talked about the silliness in an ideal world, because that's how you know someone is vulnerable. Because if you can be like silly around them and you don't fear judgment, you can be yourself. You can let loose. You don't have to like protect yourself or put up a face. And so there's a beauty in that. Yeah. I love it when I see people's authentic, like the inner child come out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're such NF gushy hearts. <laughs> it's beautiful to have a personality that, you know, cares about the state of people and the state of humanity is is what keeps humanity, it's what gives hope to humanity because when you think about the potential of humanity, you're not you're not just thinking about it in the current state, but you're thinking about 
it's like what it would be like in in the best state and it's like that's what's needed to move things forwards. Everyone in the world carries a little bit of hope in them, but like NFs also carry hope in them because they are so in tune with how the world could be better. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I feel like I carry <laughs> hope for like I like on my back for a lot of other people that don't <laughs> carry it. Um, I mean, I can be cynical sometimes, but overall, like my mindset is always hopeful because I'm always looking at what how things could be better um, if people just spend time understanding like different perspectives and stuff and um, being more compassionate and empathetic. And so I totally agree. That was really beautifully put, Joyce. I think another thing not to like, tri you know, keep, but one thing that I also think is really important in my ideal world is like having a sense of everyone having a sense of gratitude for what like the earth, like, um, you know, like, in Native American cultures, like, you know, if you, you, um, you know, you thanked, you had a sense of thankfulness to the earth for like giving, you know, like food and, and um, yeah. you would take, I think we would take, definitely take, I sound so idealistic, but I mean, definitely take better care of the planet. And there would be a sense of like, wow, I'm so thankful that I have this apple, you know, and I'm going to like give something back right. in some way because I have this, there would be a sense of like reciprocation for everything that you are. <sighs> because we're seeing how it's all connected, how we're connected to the earth yeah. and yeah. Yeah, when you treat things with value, it, it, it leads a positive cycle. Cause if you, if you start forgetting to be grateful, it, it starts a lot of other things too. Like when you treat something and you take it for granted, you start treating it a little worse. You start getting a little more lazy with it and you start to put other things more important than it. And if we start putting all of our priorities more important than the earth and other people, then we're going to end up putting our own goals in front of what really matters but we should really be putting what really matters in front of that if that makes sense <laughs> yeah absolutely but yeah any closing thoughts guys uh this was really fun i i loved connecting with all three of you and i mean i could probably come up with like two thousand more questions <laughs> for real we could probably <laughs> go on for like three hours if we didn't <laughs> stop ourselves. <laughs> this is yeah, awesome. I'd love so to great. invite you guys. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to invite you guys on another time too, so we can continue our idealistic NF talk together. <laughs> <laughs> we eventually figure out how to like change the world for sure, solve all the problems. <laughs> yeah, that'd be well, pretty you guys cool. are always welcome to come on my channel if you want to do that. Um, that would be so fun. And I do want to note, like, especially with you, Susan and Megan, um, it's so interesting because like when I, I mean, just even before I did YouTube, I was familiar with both of your like stuff online. I, I've read both of your blogs and like, I knew like who both of you were, um, not in a like, I, oh, I know this person's name is this person, but like, I was so, I was familiar with your content before I ever like put stuff on YouTube, if that makes sense. So I think it's really cool. So Aww. I know it's well, cool. I, I'll be connected. I'm sure I was like, I, I think I was familiar with your YouTube channel for a while too. And I definitely read Susan's blog probably before we ever like actually met. So it's cool to like all connect and come together. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's like all awesome. coming around full oh, sorry. circle. <laughs> I love so I, I also wanted to. I'm sorry. I yes, for around. sure. Oh, Susan, uh, you can continue. <laughs> no, I was just going to tell Emily that I really like her video, especially the one she did with the INFJ stare. The, uh, that one, I just love that. I, I love a lot of your videos. So um, the, uh, the, I'm definitely, the admiration is mutual. Oh, yeah, for sure. Those are so sweet. <laughs> This is so adorable, warm fuzzies all around. Um, so I wanted to say a bit about each of you guys because I, I like like things about all of you. Um, so with Susan, I really like Psychology Junkie and it's really well written. I love your creative description of the cognitive functions. Like what are they? And you wrote like a very romanticized version of each function. <laughs> it's like um, very beautiful and I love your site. And Thank Megan, you. 
I really love your INFJ book. Like it was very, very solid. <laughs> um, and I also really like your website. And I think you both are very incredible uh, website for MBTI and also for INFJs. So guys, check out Susan and Megan. And also Emily, I really like your YouTube channel. It, like it is really fantastic. And I love your 16 personality impersonations, your interviews, and just like seeing you interact with people in the community. Like you have a really clear stream of consciousness that is very relatable and like your audience feels really connected to you like I really enjoyed watching your YouTube videos it was like a, a pure joy um, in my life so thank you all three of you <laughs> well thank you for for putting you've been putting out a lot of great videos as well and so I think you're going to be able to share a lot with the world about type and really help people too Oh, I hope so. I hope oh, all us NFs get to leave our mark on the earth. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. Thank you so much for having us on your channel. I really, really appreciate it. Yes, thank now, you for coming on. Joyce, this is great. Yeah, I'm so glad. Um, I had like these three fantastic people on my channel so <laughs> I hope you guys all stay safe. Um, I know it's like, like we're going through a uh, COVID and that can be tough on us, but I hope that you all get through like all, all right. And if you like this video, like and subscribe and I'll leave the links to these lovely ladies down below as well. And stay safe y'all, bye. Bye. <laughs> bye. bye.